King Edward III died, and his grandson, Richard II, took the throne. The Duke of Lancaster and Lord Percy gave up their government positions and retired to private life, but Wycliffe still enjoyed the support of many noblemen. In 1377, Pope Gregory sent a message to the University of Oxford, rebuking it for allowing Wycliffe's doctrine to take root and demanding he be silenced. This encouraged the Archbishop of Canterbury and other bishops who decided to meet and agree on what should be done to punish Wycliffe. On the day Wycliffe was to be examined, a man named Lewis Clifford, who was a member of the prince's court, but not a particularly powerful man, strode up to the bishops and sternly warned them not to pass any sentence on Wycliffe. The bishops were so taken back by his demand that they took no action on Wycliffe that day. Wycliffe's sect continued to grow, despite church opposition. Some authorities at Oxford attempted to silence him. Others gave him whatever support they could. The church considered him a heretic and threatened his followers with excommunication. For some time, Wycliffe was either banished or in hiding, but he returned to his parish of Letterworth to die in 1384. In 1450, the Synod of Constance declared John Wycliffe a notorious heretic who died in his heresy and ordered his bones removed from consecrated ground. In 1425, Wycliffe was disinterred, his bones burned, and thrown into a river. But there is no denying truth, which will even spring up from the dust and ashes. Although they burned his bones and drowned his ashes, the word of God and the truth of John Wycliffe's doctrine would never be destroyed. Although King Richard allowed himself to be influenced by Popes Urban and Boniface IV and published several decrees against the new Protestant doctrines, there is no record of anyone being put to death for holding them during his reign. Sir William Sauter Richard II was deposed in 1399 and succeeded by Henry IV. In 1400, during a meeting of Parliament at Westminster, Sir William Sauter, a good man and a faithful priest, asked permission to speak for the good of the kingdom. The bishops present, suspecting that he wanted to address the subject of religion, convinced Parliament that the matter should be referred to the church convocation. So on February 12, 1400, Thomas Arundel, Archbishop of Canterbury, and his provincial council held a hearing with Sauter. They charged that he had previously renounced several heretical opinions, but continued to teach and preach them. The charges against Sauter, the parish priest of St. Skith, the Virgin in London, were as follows. He would not worship the cross on which Christ suffered. He would rather worship a temporal king, the bodies of saints, or a contrite man than the cross. He thought it was more important for a priest to teach the word of God than to say the canonical hours. He believed that the consecrated bread of communion remains bread, and it is not physically the body of Christ. Sauter was given time to prepare an answer to these charges. Reappearing before the convocation the following Friday, February 18th, he refused to abandon his beliefs, and was given one more day to consider his position. Still adamant, on the 19th, Sauter was ordered stripped of all his church offices, priest, deacon, subdeacon, acolyte, exorcist, reader, sexton, and even doorkeeper. Reduced to the state of layman, Sauter was then handed over to the secular legal authorities, and the church petitioned the king to execute him, something it could not do itself. King Henry readily agreed, becoming the first English king to ever put a heretic to death. Sir William Sauter became the first Englishman to suffer martyrdom in Henry's reign. After Sauter's death, others who believed as he did took pains to conceal themselves while the unpopular king gathered what support he could doing the will of the church, legally condemning the books of Protestantism and making burning of anyone convicted of heresy legal in England. John Badby On March 1, 1409, John Badby, a layman, was examined before Thomas Rundle, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and a number of other lords. The principal charge against him was that he believed that bread was not turned into the actual physical body of Christ upon consecration. When the examination was finished, and all the conclusions were read in English, the Archbishop asked Badby if he would renounce his beliefs and adhere to the doctrine of the Catholic faith. He answered that he would stay with his own beliefs. Badby was locked in the friar's mansion, with the Archbishop holding the key, until he appeared again on March 15th, was declared a heretic, and turned over to the secular authorities for punishment. That afternoon, John Badby was brought before Smithfield, put in an empty barrel, bound with chains to a stake, and surrounded by dry wood. As he stood there, the king's eldest son happened by, and encouraged Badby to save his life while there was still time, but Badby refused to change his opinions. The barrel was put over him, and the fire lit. When Badby felt the fire, he cried, Mercy, Lord! And the prince immediately ordered the fire extinguished. 
Then he promised Badby a year's stripend from the king if he would return to the faith of the church. Even then, Badby held his ground to the death. After Badby's death, the bishops seeking to suppress this doctrine forever, and knowing that they had a king willing to act on their wishes, drafted a law that condemned the books of heretics, and ordered all dioceses to proceed against heretics with zeal. Death by fire was declared the fate of any heretic who would not recant. After this, the Archbishop of Canterbury issued similarly harsh laws against Protestants. With all these laws against them, you would think the Protestants would have been utterly destroyed, and yet such are the works of the Lord that these men multiplied daily instead of being defeated. Their numbers especially increased in London, Lincolnshire, Norfolk, Herefordshire, Shrewsbury, Callis. Some, however, did recant. Among those were John Purvey, who recanted at Paul's Cross, John Edward, priest of the Diocese of Lincoln, Richard Herbert, and Emmett Willey of London, John Beckett of London, John Senyans of Lincolnshire. William Thorpe William Thorpe was a valiant warrior under the banner of Christ. He was examined before the Archbishop of Canterbury in 1407, accused of traveling through England for over 20 years, preaching his reform beliefs to the people. The Archbishop not only demanded that Thorpe deny his beliefs and return to the Catholic Church, but that he turn in anyone he found holding similar beliefs in the future. He was also forbidden to preach until the Archbishop was sure he was truly converted. Sir, Thorpe replied, if I agreed to this, I would have to be a spy for every bishop in England. Thorpe refused to pledge unconditional submission to the church. I will willingly obey God and his law, he said, and every member of the Holy Church that agrees with Christ. What happened to Thorpe after he was committed to prison isn't known. There is no record of his being burned, so he may have died in prison or secretly escaped. Poor Christians were being oppressed everywhere, but especially in England at this time, where the king supported the Catholic Church. The church was so strong there that no one could stand against it. Whatever it decreed was obeyed by all men. John Huss Richard II married a wife native of Bohemia, and through her servants the works of Wycliffe were carried to that country, where they were effectively preached to the people by John Huss of Prague. Pope John the Twenty-Third, seeking to suppress the Bohemians, appointed Cardinal de Columna to look into Huss's preaching and deal with any heresy he might find. So Columna set a date for Huss to appear before him in Rome. Huss never appeared on the designated date, but King Wenceslas of Bohemia sent ambassadors to assure Columna that any false doctrine being preached in his country would be taken care of by him at his expense. At the same time, Huss sent his own ambassadors to assure the cardinal he was innocent of heresy. Columna refused all their pleas and excommunicated Huss for failing to appear in person. The Bohemians couldn't have cared less about the proclamation of excommunication. The more they grew in the knowledge of the Lord through Huss, the less they cared for the Pope and his rules, especially since the church was divided at that time, with three men arguing over the office of Pope. Although the Bohemian church officials succeeded in having Huss banned from Prague, he carried on his work, spreading Wycliffe's message among the people and causing a great uproar over the church's riches and abuses. When Cecilus took advantage of his subject's state of mind to levy heavy taxes on the clergy, silencing them in Bohemia and filling his treasury at the same time. In 1414, a general church conference was held in Constance to resolve the problem of the three popes and also to deal with the Bohemians. Assured of safe conduct by both Emperor Sigismund and one of the popes, Huss traveled to the conference, arriving in Constance on November 3rd. Twenty-six days later, he appeared before the bishops to defend himself, but was not allowed to speak, in violation of the promises made to him. He was imprisoned for, quote, safekeeping and charged with eight articles of heresy. On June 7, 1415, Huss was brought before a council and condemned as a heretic when he refused to recant his support of Wycliffe's theology. He was stripped of all his church offices, made to wear a paper hat with the words Arch Heretic, and led past a fire consuming his books. On July 6, 1415, the hangman stripped Huss of his clothes, tied his hands behind him, and chained his neck to the stake. At that point, Huss told the hangman that he was glad to accept the chains for the Lord's sake. Straw and wood were piled around him to his chin, and the fire was lit. As the flames rose around him, Huss was heard to say over and over, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, have mercy on me, until the flames choked him. When all the wood was burned, the upper part of his body was still hanging in the chain, so they threw it down, made a new fire, and burned it after cutting his head into small pieces. 
When he was totally burned, Huss's ashes were carefully collected and thrown into the Rhone River.